Bonsoir. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Please get settled in. I'm Sylvie Kaufman from the uh, Le Mans newspaper, and I'm delighted to be moderating this final session of a day that has been a very rich, as always, in the Rencontre Economique. And we are going to be speaking about the state of individual freedom after the pandemic which is a very serious and important topic because it is at the heart of our democratic systems. And we've uh, already debated uh, about this over in recent years with the fight against terrorism and within the scope of an increasing digitalization of society. So uh, it, it, this has taken an entire new dimension with the health crisis. And this is what we're going to be talking about during the 45 coming minutes with four speakers, each uh, with a different point of view and uh, practice around this question. So we first of all, on my right, of course, have Barry Neen, who is American and who is the general director and founder of the Open Market Institute and who is the author of a book called Liberty from All Masters the new American autocracy against the uh, will of the people. Here in X, we also have Sylvie Melbourne, who is a practitioner uh, because uh, she officiates in the National Commission of uh, Digital Technology uh, and uh, Privacy, and she's in charge of uh, economic coordination. Good evening, Sylvie Melbourne. Uh, remotely, therefore, on your screen, uh, we have Pierre Louette who is the CEO of the group Echo and Parisian Newspapers after having been CEO of uh, the Agence Press Agency. And he is the author of a book that was published this year, Giants and Men, a book that talks about the power of the gaffers on our daily lives. Good evening, Pierre. And from London, our friend Robin Niplett, who uh, directs the Chatham House Research Center, the very well-known Chatham House Research Center. Hello, Robin. And uh, we will promise to uh, let Robin go before the beginning of the England-Ukraine match. So last but not least, as we say in the panel, our friend Alanga Algon from the Circle of Econ Economists, who will introduce the debate. And then I will give the floor to each of our speakers. And we will debate, we will discuss this subject during the remaining town, uh, time. Uh, Jan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sylvia. I would just like to give a few introductory words to this debate. Uh, to come back to the title, What Individual Freedom is in a Post-Pandemic World? This question uh, demonstrates to the, the extent to which the crisis that we have uh, experienced is uh, of an entirely other nature than any other uh, uh, crisis that we've experienced. I think the last crisis of the 20th century was the financial crisis. The financial crisis we could manage in a technocratic manner uh, without raising the question of individual freedoms and uh, the, the history of economy. We used to look at how to manage the uh, interest rates and lower the interest rates, have an expansionist budget, but never we, we never raise questions about society as a whole. The uh, current health crisis is the first crisis of the 21st century, and the future crisis, be they pandemics or climate crisis, will have be of the same type. It is a, a, a total social type a fact which mobilizes cooperation of all citizens. Of course, uh, you've held many discussions on the arbitration between freedom and effectiveness to fight against the propagation of the uh, pandemic. You, you've read powerful articles that showed that this uh, arbitration differed in, in particular in democratic countries or Asian countries with uh, articles in particular by Stephanie Tonjeva. But behind this question of liberty lies the fundamental question of cooperation. First of all, cooperation of citizens uh, between themselves. The trust uh, that the citizens place in each other. You can see that in countries where this uh, trust capital was very, very strong, the state didn't need to intervene. The typical example is that of Sweden, where there were far, far, was far more freedom because there were fewer strict rules uh, in the lockdown because the citizens actually were not requesting this and uh, trusted the voluntary uh, distance. 
uh, that they installed within each other. But in France and Italy, for example, you had rules, uh, lockdown rules, that entered into conflict with uh, with freedom and that were far stricter. The second type of corporation or trust is what we call vertical trust, and uh, that is the citizens with regard to the governments and experts. In the countries where you have a very strong amount of trust placed in the government, the measures that uh, might seem to frame, give a framework to freedom were far better accepted. But you also have the trust of governments with regard to their own citizens and even the governments with regard to their own administrations. The countries where there is very little trust with regard to citizens are countries where we really set a very strict framework around freedoms because we didn't think that the citizens were able to maintain social distancing by themselves. So with regard to this vertical trust, a new element appeared, and that is the trust of citizens, not only with regard to their governments, but with regard to experts and scientists and with regard to information, with regard to the protection, not only of their data, but the protection of their lives and the, uh, the ability of the scientists to protect them. And the country's experience had a very different experience of the crisis. We led uh, large international surveys in uh, Science Po uh, School, which showed that in a country such as France, the trust in scientists uh, dropped by 20%. We went from about 90% to trust, and currently we're around 70% of trust. So what was the role of information? What was the role of fake news? of the experts in this uh, uh, preservation of trust in scientists. That is also part of the uh, s subject of this debate. But what it showed is the co-production of cooperation between citizens, governments, and experts uh, and information. And this raises many questions regarding the social contract, fake news, uh, data protection, so many questions that we will be talking about during, during this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan. So the relationship, uh, you've clearly made the link between trust and freedom. So Barry Lynn, I'm going to begin with you. Can you explain how we build systems that are able to resist uh, the shocks of pandemics or health crisis, security crisis or terrorist crisis without giving up our uh, freedom and democracy. What is your American experience of this question? Well, thank you all. And uh, it's actually really nice to be at a physical meeting with people. And I actually want to thank Jean Hervé for really pushing this to happen this year. This, it's really important. I run a lot of, I run a lot of meetings, and it's, uh, I believe it's, of a central, it's essential for people to get together. So you know, how did we get into this problem? You know, I think from my point of view, and this is something that I've been studying very closely for well more than 20 years, you know, the problem begins 40 years ago. It begins at the, the time of Reagan and Thatcher. And it begins with this idea of neoliberalism. It begins with a revolution in how the United States treats its competition policy. And what happened 40 years ago under Reagan is we entirely altered how we treat our competition policy. 25 years ago, that revolution continued. It continued in the international sphere at the WTO. And basically, we, in the, the WTO system was an imposition of the neoliberal principles onto the international system. In tandem, these two changes, the changes of how do we regulate competition at home and how do we regulate competition internationally, because that's what an international system does. In tandem, these two changes eliminated all protections against monopoly. They eliminated protections against monopoly domestically, and they eliminated protections against monopoly internationally. They also eliminated protection against the mercantilists, mercantilist nations like China, nations acting like monopolists. It was a political economic revolution as great as any that we have seen since 1776, since 1789. The revolutions of 1776 and 1789 were essentially overthrown by the neoliberal revolution. 
So what's the result? <laughs> the result today is, you know, f one of the results today is the fact that we have this fantastic fragility in the industrial systems on which we rely. One of the things that COVID taught us is that there's all of these things that are pretty easy to make and we didn't have them. We didn't have masks. We didn't have tests. We didn't have basic drugs. More recently, we found that we don't have semiconductors. We don't have vital chemicals, industrial chemicals. We don't have basic medical devices. We don't have the vaccines we need when we need them. We're all fighting over them. The New York Times recently put a, wrote a piece that said, why is nothing working anymore? <laughs> Nothing is working anymore because the monopolists choked off all of the systems, broke the systems, because they can make more money that way. The second and closely related problem here is our growing dependence on autocratic nations, China especially. China is the most sophisticated mercantilist in history. It wields power over individuals and over corporations, really powerful corporations, like Apple. It basically gets to tell Apple what to do. It wields power over other nations. Germany is very much under this way of China. China uses this power to concentrate more power, to move more and more industrial capacity into its own hands. And then it uses that capacity, that control, that dependence that we have on China to manipulate us, to get us to do things that they want us to do. The third problem, and this is a, also a result of the changes, the neoliberal revolution, is the growing power and control of Google, Facebook, and Amazon and to a lesser extent, Apple, over individuals, over corporations, and over nations. I hope uh, you guys paid a lot of attention to what Google and Facebook recently did to Australia. They basically tried to smash Australia into putting up with whatever they wanted Australia to do. We are seeing, in other words, a fantastic pyramiding of power in the hands of one or two nations that control vital links in the supply chains on which we all depend, and a pyramiding of power in the hands of a few corporations, Google, Facebook, and Amazon especially, that have captured power over everyone else, over our communication systems, how we talk to one another, how we share news with one another. In sum, you add these up and what we have is the greatest set of threats to our liberty and to our democracy and also to our, net, our security since the end of the Second World War. So I'm at the end of my five minutes and mm -hmm. we'll talk about this later. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I want us all to understand is that as bad as this moment is, we are going to overcome this problem. And in fact, we already are. My organization in Washington, the Open Markets Institute, we have won huge victories over Google, Facebook, and Amazon the past few years. A person I hired out of college was appointed last week to be the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, which is the most powerful regulatory agency mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, the next revolution is underway. And the way, Jan earlier used the word cooperation, the only way that we're actually going to complete this next revolution, the one that restores democratic control, protects our liberty, is through cooperation between nations, between France and the United States, Europe and the United States, all of the democracies working together against Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and against China. Merci. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very political uh, presentation. Um, we, it is indeed a very political presentation of the topic, but we'll, we'll discuss that again. We're here to propose solutions, and we'll discuss that later on. Sophie Nierbon, you experienced a crisis in a very practical way. You had a health crisis in the National Commission on uh, Compu and from, uh, IT and Free Freedom. 
uh, you know, you were the you wanted to ensure prevention, control, or even the vaccination strategy was were challenged. So, can you tell us uh, rapidly and uh, well, a bit of time how the CNIL uh, managed the situation and what was your problems? Well, indeed, I'd say that uh, for the CNIL, which is the regulatory authority for the control of personal data or information for the general uh, regulation on the protection of personal data, you know, the RGPD, which was already mentioned uh, uh, several times. And it's quite interesting, actually, to re follow this because we are in economic uh, meetings. It's interesting to think about the, the key role of this European regulation, which is the proud and joy of Europeans because we were able to uh, to set a global standard when it comes to pro uh, protection of personal data. So it's a strong reference. So, well, you know, in the, in California now, uh, there is almost uh, like, uh, you know, a copy and paste of uh, uh, RGPD for the protection of consumers. But in other states, the, pro the draft of federal law in the U.S is uh, in, you know, uh, being drafted. Uh, I'm sure it will come out. And uh, in South America, in Africa, in Asia, several civil laws have been uh, issued because uh, you cannot, well, we've seen that there cannot be, there can be no digital transition without having this uh, block uh, on the protection of personal data, which in Europe is a fundamental right acknowledged as such, such as the freedom of speech, and which uh, is the, the founding basis of European values. So this is, these are fundamental rights that the, uh, the CNIL is uh, has to enforce in France. And, uh, and within the framework of your European cooperation with the 27, 27 member states in Brussels, you know, to ensure a European governance and a coherent application of this regulation. Now, the CNIL faced exactly the same problems as any other administration or company. I mean, overnight, we also had to go to uh, telework, so to shift to telework to ensure, keep ensuring our services. And our services were, uh, you know, we had to support public authorities, provide support to public authorities in the IT systems uh, implemented, be it, uh, you know, the stop COVID application, which uh, uh, which uh, turned it to be all anti-COVID, be it the uh, SIF files or, uh, you know, uh, con uh, you know, the contact uh, files or all medical research uh, projects triggered to better understand the pandemic and be able to overcome it. And of course, and this was the management as such of the fight against the pandemics, but they, we also had to manage all new situations that uh, employers face, for example, uh, to maintain uh, the presence of some of their employees um, who had to be on site in, uh, you know, in uh, sanitary conditions which complied with all the regulations. So, you know, we had uh, uh, gates taking temperature, drones checking the presence of employees in public spaces who were wearing ma a mask or not, and they. Uh, and this was well, eventually this was prohibited, but you know these drones. But anyway, we had several topics to deal to deal with. I'll spare you the details because uh, for time constraints. But let me close with, or oh, to conclude with what Barry just said about the fact that the RGPD, in fact, the uh, GDPR, sorry, is a, is a lower set. Uh, look, the the US are very good for this. Uh, you know the Europeans. Uh, uh, our right to imp uh, to di to display the standards and uh, impose them to any company which would like to impose it to European citizens. The protection capsule will apply regardless of the uh, 
uh, concerning the, the data of European citizens wherever they are in the world, but and companies which are not in Europe and that will target uh, European citizens. We know have to comply with the GDPR, and civil society has uh, has come to us in many aspects at the national or European level. You know, which had to. And this is not to be, and there were, there's been sanction, you know, sanction of 100 million euro uh, that the CNIL imposed to Google in 2020, 35 million euro to Amazon for uh, the non respect of the right of uh, 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 internals or web users on the, in the cookies, you know, cookies that make it possible to identify navigation on the internet to, send, to address targeted uh, advertising. And uh, it's only the beginning, and I would say that indeed we are at a time of, uh, you know, regaining our sovereignty. It was mentioned this morning, and uh, this sovereignty is for the individuals, you know, to reappropriate their right to better control and master data that concerns them, that is their um, digital identity. But companies, which of course want the uh, Rules should be applied. Uh, rules of the game should be applied, but clear in a clear manner, but to all companies and not just European ones. And for the states, of course, with the sovereignty issue, we talked about the sovereign cloud. This is an initiative which we are supporting and promoting together with um, the Orange uh, Project on New Blue Society, which was mentioned this morning as well. And we can feel that this uh, protection of personal data is in line with uh, the European projects to uh, relaunch an uh, industrial policy for uh, European sovereignty. Thank you, Sophie. So, you know, we want to uh, regain our data and the digital space by the citizen Pierre Louet. We talked, uh, about, we talked about the central role of the, the, the principle of trust and the role of the media. I mean, no, as, as, a, as a transmission system, you know, you run a group of uh, mainstream media, but at the same time, you uh, looked closely at the at the power of the big tech. Uh, so, are they in the context of our discussion now, uh, since the beginning of the session, are they truly uh, a threat? A menace? You know, are they as powerful as the, as they say, or what? And what you? From what you've seen, do they really are they really a threat to our uh, freedom, our liberty? Because they were supposed to multiply freedom, in fact. Well, sorry, I was in the creation of website in 96, 97. We created the first website in the country for many brands, and indeed, we saw. I was I saw the advent of Google. And there were other players that they all disappeared almost, you know, uh, you know, like Sot Labrador, you know. Uh, uh, so if they disappeared initially, it's because those players were better than the others. That is, well, we are in, you know, a competition based on merit, you know. They were very good and they imitated their competition. But the reason why I started looking into this kind of a fight, struggle, which is still going on at the IFP Orange. And the, uh, I saw as well how those young players became giants. Sometimes uh, I would say, uh, you know, a bit awkward in the way they were moving on. And, uh, and sometimes they had to be integrated in our legal and economic order. And the representative of the CNIL mentioned that because, in fact, they grew, they grew so fast and they, 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 they sort of, uh, um, um, you know, damage the the the, the order. You know, the right to competition, for example. This is a key point for us. You know, the the competition for the fiscal order as well, and the protection of data. I know these points. Barry said it. We are making headways, but you know, it's 15 years now. It's been 15 years now, almost 20 years that we sort of uh, took. Uh, we took step backs, and the position have been distorted. So, for the press, what is clear for the media in 10 years, French press lost 50% of its advertising revenues. 
uh, television kept its position, so did radio, while the revenues went mainly to the new players, you know, of the social networks. And, uh, and, uh, and press was not very good, was not very clever, in fact, was not very smart after all, and bad luck. Well, in fact, two things. It's not that simple. It's not that the press was not, was not smart, in fact, and we are more and more becoming more uh, efficient and uh, clever, you know, with, uh, with uh, we now use the uh, subscri digital subscribers, you know, and the press, now the written press now is working on digital subscribers. But mainly we faced uh, a way of working or a way of action, the captation of value and attention by the new players, which was huge. And the reason why I even wrote a book, because I'm not exactly a theorician, or uh, I'm not someone who has a lot of free time to, to write books. I do it during the lockdown, which was good for a good thing in that respect. Well, we go from uh, the constant economic uh, issue to a democratic issue. The democratic issue, and this is where I'll be in line with my colleagues, the democratic issue being that companies are born in a specific zone, uh, then they took advantage uh, of uh, the, the patented uh, laws of internet economy, you know, also economies of scale, the network uh, effects, the ability to be the, f the first crushing the possible number two, number one crushing number two, they, they change the framework, they, they reshuffle the frameworks of competition. Um, and we've seen in the past uh, uh, operations validated where we said, oh, you know, you know, there is uh, no problem because a large company buys another one which doesn't have the turnover, but it's not a problem because there is no consolidation per se. And we did not realize at the time in this uh, uh, right of competition 1.0 that what was concentrated were volumes of data profiles. And this was the new currency, you know. Uh, recently, uh, I tried to make this uh, formula quite popular. If data is the new currency of the world, well, GAFAM are central banks. You know, they, they clearly manipulate and control and utilize them. What I want to say to conclude my introduction is that uh, clearly there is a business logic, uh, business plan. They want to develop their audience, their market share, their tech companies and advertising companies have that to want to maximize their advertising revenues. And this uh, business logic uh, leads to the, the design of algorithm, which lead to a form of addiction. and lead to people being enclosed, blocked, you know, into contents, which will, uh, it's, it's like an addiction, enclosure system and separation, which in a way of isolation, which cannot be reconciled with the democratic system. So there will be many segments like that next to one another and little space to get together. And this is what often I say, if Facebook has become, you know, the world agora with 3.5 billion people who, who visit uh, uh, Google, well, uh, Facebook, well, it is so important that it needs to be regulated. So those are companies which in, are super supranational, we mentioned it, you know, they, they, they start negotiating with states. Australia is, wants to adopt a law, they, you know, uh, well, I don't like it, I'm going to leave Australia, and eventually at the end, there's a kind of a transaction, but not from a state to, not from state to state, but from business to states. And this leads us to consider that we are dealing with an issue which is not just economic, but it is a, a reg democratic regulation of op or public opinion shaping, not to mention the fake news. So thank you. This is how we uh, thank you for uh, explaining to us clearly this transition from an economic problem to a democratic problem. Robin Niblett. You have another experience of this issue, which is the British expense. So we saw in the last few years uh, quite uh, rough in the US how the notion of trust was at the core of, uh, of the discussion on, on Brexit and like and for us for the, uh, about the pandemics. Give us your vision, British vision and possibly a couple of leads that you or avenues that you've observed and how to could we overcome this crisis of trust? 
Thanks very much, Sylvie. It's great to be uh, with you, um, though a very great shame not to be with you in Ave right now and, and being able to enjoy uh, the woods and the forests uh, with you at this time. Um, look, I just I know we've got limited time. I want to make uh, maybe two or three points only. Um, and I suppose the first one I want to ask is this whole concept of individual freedoms. I think we have an assumption that it is objective. But if there's one thing that uh, the Brexit experience taught us in the UK, it's that one person's freedom is to another person an imposition on their freedom. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, my daughter, I remember after the Brexit vote came in, was distraught. Uh, she said to us, I feel like I've had my, one of my human rights taken away from me. You know, I can't travel in Europe, I can't work there. I, I've lost some of my freedom uh, to travel to Rome uh, and to feel that I belong to something bigger. But as we know, one of the big drivers of Brexit actually was uh, the sense that the freedom of movement of people was great for business, but for many British citizens, it stressed uh, social services, it put a cap on wages. Um, and in essence, uh, that freedom of, of being in the EU to other people was a constraint. Um, and I think another dimension of this sort of debate over what is uh, freedom and what isn't is the big emphasis on support for minority and minority group individual freedoms in liberal democratic societies. For most of us, this seems like a, uh, an obvious thing to do. Um, but for so many people in our societies, this is actually a threat to their sense of social identity, uh, to their sense of freedom of how they can live as they want to. So we've had this kind of rise of illiberal or the highly conservative or right-wing parties across Europe partly because they are trying to create an emotional connection and then back to their identity and feel that, uh, uh, let's call the metropolitan globalized elites, have been taking it away from them. The irony of COVID, of course, especially for Brexit Britain, is that it has led to the return of the experts, which uh, Michael Gove, one of the big backers of Brexit in the UK, uh, criticized all the time. The experts don't know what they're doing. So you have this strange situation of the Johnson government uh, trying at the same time to keep in touch with the emotional base uh, of his supporters who tend to be very skeptical of experts, skeptical of lockdown, skeptical of the steps the government is taking, other than vaccines, by the way, and that's more kind of a confidence in the national health system. But uh, he's really stuck between those and the need for experts to uh, get out of COVID. So it does seem to me like the COVID crisis is posing a real dilemma for governments, including in the UK. So how are we dealing with this? And I think, uh, again, I wanted to make a point right at the beginning. I'd be interested to hear Pierre and others' views on this. My sense is that transparency, one of the questions in this, for this panel, truth does not help uh, in an era of polarization and democratization of opinion, of the, of the democratization of communication, of, of, of social media. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Thomas Jefferson, I think I'm saying here, a person cannot be argued out of something they were not argued into. Um, so, uh, you know, we have two options for our political leaders to finish up here uh, very quickly. A growing majority uh, feel that um, they need to overcome the crisis with more government control, a bigger government agenda for the state. And we see this in the UK with uh, the leveling up agenda, a focus on economic justice, uh, trying to create jobs through, through infrastructure and the green revolution. But we're also seeing Boris Johnson trying to keep a connection with the emotional dimension of politics, doubling down on the culture war, taking on the BBC, uh, rejecting appointments to cultural institutions, uh, voting rights, uh, you know, voters needing proof of identity. And, and the Labour Party, our left, don't know how to connect emotionally anymore with the voters in the UK. They've been swept to one side by the Scottish Nationalists, a regional party that has emotional connection. So my, my worry, I suppose, Sylvie, is that in the future, um, this COVID-19 era has brought us back to the value of truth of evidence. But I think politics is still stuck uh, in a process of rediscovering emotion. Uh, and it's going to be a very bumpy ride. I'll stop there. 
Merci beaucoup. C'est... <rire> Thank you very much. You're um, really uh, uh, giving us a very complex and paradoxical uh, picture of things, but it's very interesting. And it shows us that um, uh, the problem is far from over. Uh, Barry, maybe I'm going to come back to you first with these questions that have been raised. We see these paradoxes also in uh, the return of the state. Authority. So a decision was made following the events on the 6th of January in Washington. And this decision was interpreted very differently in the United States and in Europe. And this is a decision to close Donald Trump, uh, Trump's Twitter and Facebook accounts. And we can see that uh, this decision, which politically was going in the right direction, was actually uh, once again taken by these private enterprises, by these internet giants who uh, stood in for the states. This is what we, uh, how we saw things in, in, in Europe. How do you manage this uh, paradox? Is it a dissolution? That's a great question. And uh, my organization is one of the few that as much as we may have opposed Donald Trump and as much as we certainly opposed the effort to overthrow democracy on January 6th, we also have made very clear that it is not the job of Google or Facebook to be our censors. No one elected them. No one gave them any authority. They are acting on their own, and this is unacceptable in any democracy. And, uh, you know, I think there's been a... Uh, there's a lot of confusion in the United States right now about, uh, you know, uh, about whether Google, Facebook, and Amazon are, uh, you know, how do we leverage these corporations? And the fact is, is that we do not leverage them. We break them up, and that what we don't break up, we neutralize. These are not. These are concentrations of power that are direct threats to our democracy, and the only pathway forward is, is to reassert our own sovereignty. Now, the good news, as I mentioned before, is we're doing that. Now, one thing about the state, the role of the state, anti-monopoly is the use of the state, the all-powerful state to break power in a way that reduces the power, concentrations of power in the private sector and in the public. That's one of the truths that we used to know. Breaking things up allows us to have a smaller state, a less intrusive state. Merci. Um, <laughs> I hope you have a great support here. I see that you have a great deal of support here, in particular from the uh, Cercle des Economistes. A great deal of support you have here. So, uh, Sophie Narbonne, what do you think about this debate? In France, we're not in the same situation, of course, but the uh, CNIL uh, really promoted the European agenda. So, is the European level, you talked about GDPR, of course, but within these debates, with the gaffers and the internet giants. Are we really better armed at the European level uh, and to the, with regard to the question of democracy? Obviously, we can't do otherwise. As we weighed at the French level, so we had the feeling, as I said, uh, Google and Amazon, uh, we, 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 we took action against them for a problem of transparency and, and non-respect of obtaining consent of, uh, of, of uh, individuals um, to, to click them. Maybe it was just a, a, it's a... And you don't have any difficulties because Robin mentioned earlier on the question of uh, illiberal democracy. And we have a, a few of these in the Euro European Union. And in the work that you're doing at the European level, is this not a problem? No. Just, uh, just like the enthusiasm of the Sacre des Economistes, our position with regard to the GAFA is unanimous uh, regarding 
Euro on behalf of the European authorities with regard to data protection. The only problem, and this was underlined, is the uh, the slow, very slow pace of procedures because we do have a system that is based on a um, lead partner authority, which is the authority of the country in which the GAFA is established. And as they're either in Ireland or in Luxembourg, mostly in Ireland, moreover, uh, the Irish authorities are completely submerged. And uh, they have problems of national law in their procedures, which do not facilitate things. And as the European Commission for Justice said, we need to find a quick way out because when we are called upon by associations such as None of Your Business and the Association of Max Schramms, who brought down the Privacy Shield by calling upon the European Court to invalidate the agreement between the European Commission and the American Department of Trade to say that Considering uh, the American uh, criminal laws, the transfer of data of European uh, citizens to the United States could not be done in compliance with GDPR on the basis of this agreement that was negotiated and which was invalidated, which created a le uh, strong legal insecurity. Uh, for all countries, and uh, for which the European Committee, Committee for Protection of Data um, issued recommendations no later than 10 days ago uh, to uh, plan for specific uh, uh, guarantees and encryption of data to guarantee the recuperation and possibility of access by American public authorities. Thank you. So we have very little time left. I would like to come back to Pierre Louet, to our two speakers who are with us remotely, very briefly, and then allow Jan to uh, also step in at the end for the conclusion. So Pierre, could you please uh, react to the question raised by Robin earlier on, on transparency? How do we manage this problem? How do we overcome it? For him, uh, at, at the stage where we're at today, transparency and the quest for systematic quest of truth may not be uh, the right uh, uh, tool now. What, think what do that. you think? I'm not sure I really understand uh, uh, the point you're trying to make, uh, to be absolutely transparent with you. <clears throat> Uh, that what I what I wanted to add, listening to my colleagues, was that there is a general challenge. If we come back to the question of Europe, which is to raise our game, it's very trivial to say this, but what the gaffers do is that they oblige us to raise our game. So uh, the United States are currently doing this because Biden has appointed two of the main protagonists of the intellectual anti-gaffer battle, Nina Khan and Tim Nien, Um and I'm mentioning them in the, my book. And uh, they've been appointed. So they carry this ideology, which is that the worst enemy of liberalism is the monopoly. And the, the worst enemy of uh, uh, also is data control. So the enthusiasm and the spirit that reigns uh, uh, in, in the, and it goes in this direction. Secondly, raising your game also means, and this was mentioned just now by Mrs. Nelburn, uh, Europe is not yet Europe. I'm very European. And if we can have fiscal optimization, it's because Europe can prevent it. That's the way it is. So we have to be even more integrated. We have to we, to have an even more integrated economic space. When I was an operator in a multinational group, I could see that when Orange went to Spain or Romania, there wasn't weren't exactly the same consumer laws, not the same interpretation of co competition laws. It's not an entirely integrated economic space. Whereas the United States um, uh, uh, achieved this. So let us make sure and in recent years, uh, this has been the case in France, we, that uh, very powerful uh, players may come, may, may, may come out of the ground. There's no reason why they, they should only come out of the ground in the United States or in China. When we talk about this type of player, I think that at least uh, we could try to uh, regulate them. And uh, I think that the, the Chinese paradigm is very different. Robin, uh, 
Europe as an instrument, Robin, last time, Robin Nibble. So Europe, unfortunately, uh, it's no longer a tool for you, but you talked about the state. Now, don't you think that do you really trust the state to be able to uh, respect individual freedom? Well, les garantir, je veux dire. Um, if the state is governed by liberal democratic principles, which involves the separation of powers, uh, an independent judiciary, uh, a strong civil society, which includes a, a strong and vibrant and competitive media, um, uh, you know, checks and balances, then uh, yeah, I trust the state. Um, I've been involved uh, earlier today and yesterday with a dialogue with people in China um, who are spending all of their time criticizing the weakness of the West and the weakness of democracy. Um, but I would much rather take my chances um, in a competitive environment where we have the transparency at least to be able to know who's in charge and who isn't um, than I would uh, a system where, you know, the state was overly dominant. So I'm, I'm comfortable with a state uh, that exists on democratic principles. I'm not comfortable with states uh, that, that dominate the world or dominate their own countries without that level of protection. So maybe that's the simplest answer I can give. Merci, merci beaucoup. Uh, merci à... Thank you, gentle, ladies and gentlemen, for this interesting discussion. Yann, what do you draw from this? Three points, three key points first. As Pierre mentioned, you know, increase the, the level of the game, but you know, rights first about the right antitrust law, law, you know, you know, state of law, you know, you go from, uh, you know, you go from the, the, the you know, everything uh, from the, you know, individual law to the fight against uh, the GAFAM, the law, the state of law. And then, of course, this has a role to play, but it's not enough. Let me give you just one example about data. Well, data initially, which were produced by GAFAM, were essential to fight the pandemics. All the states used Google and Google mobility rate to see the spreading or to, what, to monitor the spreading of the pandemics. Now, if you want to gain sovereignty or freedom, you have to produce your own data rather than to say, OK, let's regulate them. We've become dependent on uh, those systems. Let me de I'll take the example of France. Le the INSEM took a long time to put data online continuously. It took us about six months. You know, we had, you know, we had problems of coordinating, to coordinate uh, in surveys or investigation at large scales. So, you know, wishful thinking is a very good thing. Sovereignty, you know, sovereignty will come through innovation and from uh, through being able to reappropriate the creation of data as a, and, a, and tools. And uh, it was mentioned by all the speakers. So the point is a question of emotion. Yeah, emotion, freedom. You know, uh, emotions are went through two phases at the time of the pandemics, and I hope there will be a third phase. First phase was fear you know, sideration, fear. All international surveys we saw were the central emotion, fear. And in the fear, freedom may be damaged. Freedom can be, you can, you're ready to accept a lot of sacrifice of your freedom when you're in fear. Then a second feeling, especially in the second, second third stage of pandemics, anger, anger, the feeling not to be prepared, not to have proper arbitrations that would express freedom. So third feeling, and I do hope that we'll uh, to transform this anger into hope. And I do, ho I do hope that the Rencontre Dex, with all the topics covered from reindustrialization, innovation, European equations, well, will make it possible to convey a message of hope at the end of the weekend. Thank you all. Have a good evening. So. Let's let's have a bit of jazz that's good for us.